Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Fred and Lou Hartwig family, Peter and Barbara Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize, and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly. Our topics this week in the mayor's race, show me the money, a no show for Medicaid expansion in Kansas and the biggest show in politics, the Democratic presidential primary, plus, of course, roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and look at one of the city council races to be decided on June the 18th. Our guest is a candidate in the 3rd District on the city's east side. This race will be decided only by voters in the district, not citywide as some races are. We talked with one candidate last week. Now we meet the other. He's Joseph Thomas, sometimes known as Joey Cuts. Mr. Thomas, welcome to Ruckus. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Tell me about Joey Cuts. How did you get that nickname? Uh, from my business, actually. Uh, so Joey Cuts uh, Barber Salon, established back in 2008. Uh, on 39th Indiana, you know, um, uh, it was a great shop, great salon. Uh, it was my first business that I ever owned. Um, I was there for about five, six years. Then we had the opportunity to expand down to 18th and Vine, uh, which now we have 18OV Barber Salon. But uh, Joby Cuts kind of just stuck with it, and it became a very household brand and uh, a cool little nickname. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, speaking of 18th and Vine, mm -hmm. uh, I always like to ask about the future of that area in terms of economic development. What do you think? Uh, I think the future is looking good. Uh, I, I, I co-chair uh, a committee called the Citizens Advisory Committee with Andrea Shelby, uh, and also I'm working with another board uh, underneath the Citizens Advisory Committee uh, uh, developing the CID. So uh, we're looking to either create the CID or privatize 18th and Vine to really try to help with some, I, I guess you would say, economic stimulus. You know, so um, um, in regards to creating some different avenues or some different approaches to really help uh, from a, a stakeholder standpoint, not necessarily a city standpoint. We've got to get the Jazz Museum prof profitable and, yeah, and yeah, still functioning. That, and, and also try to purchase some property and some land down there so we can include some other type of businesses down there as well because it, it's, it, it needs some more daytime traffic as well as the nighttime entertainment traffic. So let me ask you this, what prompted you to run for the city council? Uh, me, I feel like it was time, you know, uh, without a doubt, conviction in my heart uh, from a spiritual aspect, you know, I prayed about it, thought about it, I received an answer, um, and also uh, really just time. I've been dedicated to my community for over a decade um, serving, providing jobs for, providing resources, uh, food, whatever the case, uh, developing solutions, um, tackling problems head on. And from what my understanding is and what I'm learning, that should be all the qualifications that a councilman or a woman should have. So. Well, we know you're interested in 18th and Vine. Mm -hmm. Tell me a couple of other issues that prompted you to get in the race, things you're concerned about. Uh, the community. You know, uh, without a doubt, for over 10 years, uh, my focus has always been to provide for the community. Um, you mean the greater community? The greater the community. Kansas you know, City, people Metro that need. You know, uh, for me being a barber, you know, I get the opportunity to talk to people on a daily basis. I'm talking to 10, 20, 30 people that sit in my chair, not to mention the 10, 20, 30 people that sit no. in the other chairs. So every day we have the opportunity to get a sense of what's going on citywide, uh, whether it be in district or outside the district. And uh, people, um, they, they're, they're looking for proper leadership. They're looking for fair leadership, transparent leadership. You know, a lot of those things are, um, is really what prompted me, uh, listening to the people, really taking a sense of what's going on, what, what they're asking for. We hear from a lot of candidates and others who say Kansas City, Missouri is taxed too much. Mm -hmm. Do you think Kansas City is taxed too much? I mean, I, I, from the area I come from, I think people don't want to have to spend extra money if they don't have to, you know. Uh, so how can we create more ways instead of spending money, maybe more ways of them developing more money so they can have that to spend, I think would be a, a, a very focus. Are you and your future constituents excited about a new airport? It's happening. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, rather you excited about it Should I take that night. as no, you're not excited? <laughs> I mean, yeah, rather excited about it or not, you know, you step up to the plate uh, it's when it's your turn to swing. Rather, you, rather it's a fastball or curveball, you got you to gotta hit the ball. So, 
Uh, are you backing either of the candidates for mayor specifically? Are you campaigning for one or the other? Uh, I haven't made that choice yet. Uh, I'm definitely campaigning for more people to get registered to vote. Definitely campaigning for more people to get involved in the process to learn, uh, develop those relationships, and increase some of these uh, voter turnout numbers because right now it's slightly embarrassing. Just be frank. Tell me a couple of other issues that concern you. Mm, uh, I mean, you know, within the community that I uh, serve and want to represent, uh, crime is an issue, yeah. affordable housing is an issue, job opportunities are an issue, uh, hope is an issue, you know, empowerment is an issue, um, um, communication is an issue. So those are a lot of things that I really feel like um, uh, needs to be focused on, you know. Campaign going well? Campaign's going well. Uh, I'm learning a lot, having good fun with it, learning to really not allow it to stress me and just, you know, enjoy every moment. And I admire your hair. Well, I appreciate that. Who, yeah, yeah. who fixes your hair? <laughs> you, you can't cut your own that way, can you? Right. I tell people all the time the reason why my hair is so long because all the good barbers work the same hours. You've got to run. Good luck in the campaign. <laughs> Third you. District City Council candidate Joseph Thomas. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Attorney Laura McConwell is a former mayor of Mission, Kansas. Jason Grill is the founder of J. Grill Media and a senior advisor at Paris Communications, has many other jobs we don't have time to mention. Lisa Johnston is a columnist and consultant. And Patrick Tuohy is director of municipal policy at the Show Me Institute, a free market think tank. Welcome to all of you. Thanks very much for coming in. There's much to discuss, so let us begin. We talk a lot about money and political campaigns. Money is the mother's milk of politics. Follow the money. Who's raised the most? Who are the donors? Why are they giving? In the current race for mayor, some new money numbers are now available. Following the early April primary, Jolie Justice received about $300,000 more. Quentin Lucas, $178,000. Lucas is backed by and receive money from the police and fire unions and others. Justice's support also includes funding from unions, including the UAW. Each has many other group and individual donations. At least one group has contributed to both, the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce. Now, why give to both? Does the chamber have trouble making up its collective mind, Patrick? I suspect what a lot of these organizations are doing is buying access. Uh, they want to make sure that the candidates in the race pick up the phone and answer when, uh, when they call. It's not a matter of buying a vote. It's just making sure that uh, when an important vote happens after an election that, that you have access. And I think in a close race like this, they're just hedging their bet. Why else would people or organizations give money to support a candidate? Well, certainly if they have an agenda that they hope will be looked upon favorably, that's sometimes a reason. Then there are obviously the true believers who really are gung-ho about you know one person or the other. In the case of the Chambers move, it's something that I've seen a lot and even saw in my own race when I ran for U.S. Senate. Many organizations, both for donations and endorsements, will hedge their bets. They'll either endorse both, donate to both, or sometimes neither because they don't want to offend one side or the other and they want to be in the good graces of whomever wins the race. How, how did you feel about that when you were a candidate, that you got support in terms of finances and perhaps an endorsement from somebody who turns around and does the same thing for your opponent? As a candidate, you don't like it. It's very disappointing because you want to have a distinctive. You want to be able to say, I was the one who got this endorsement and have you be the one that gets the donation because if you both get the same well, donation, it's then it's a wash. Yeah, I mean, exactly. It's, it's I mean, you have the funds and so that's a good thing in a campaign, but ultimately you want the advantage over your opponent. She hit the nail on the head, Mike, with, with you either give to all of the candidates or you give to none of them. That's yeah. what the advice would be as a consultant to any of these people that want to get involved in government, is you have to, you have to just decide if you're going to do that or just stay out of it until we get to this, this general election. We're talking about organizations, not private citizens, are we? No, I'm uh, talking about you know business folks yeah. more so. How about, <laughs> Laura, since you ran for mayor and won uh, several times, do contributions uh, make a major difference? Sometimes it depends on who makes those contributions. And I can see that if you have two candidates and you like both candidates and you know that one of those candidates is the one you're going to have to work to work with after Election Day, that you would 
support both of them and you'd give money both of them and not necessarily be a game changer. I had um, actually someone who was really well respected in the Johnson County community that I had when I ran for unsuccessfully for county commission that I went to meet with and at the meeting in his office he said you know I like you both I really don't care who wins I'm going to give you money but I'm also going to give him money mm -hmm. and so the next time I ran into my opponent I told him I wanted a thank you note because I you know secured a donation for him. <laughs> uh, Jason do you know how expensive it is to run a successful campaign for well mayor? it depends I mean, this race may be close to a million dollars I would think uh, city council's a lot less depends on how competitive they are but I the city council races are getting literally yeah. no exposure in this race uh, so maybe a little less actually hundred thousand maybe two hundred thousand I know state rep races in competitive districts cost up to 250 to 500 with outside expenditures and targeted races I mean it's getting pretty expensive mayor is is definitely increased a lot since the last few and, races. And I think it's ridiculous how expensive it is for any race and it, I think it does create a, a barrier and probably a bar to entry for a lot of people that are going to be interested in running in any race, not just this one, with the amount of money it would cost. Patrick, uh, there's a lot of criticism that the two candidates for mayor have no major differences. Do you think that's the case? Uh, it does certainly seem that way uh, and I am surprised that both of them haven't been more aggressive in trying to describe the differences between them. I think the, the star has generally said that uh, Jolie Justice is kind of more aligned with developers. I think that's generally true. Uh, but uh, what's important about uh, Justice is that she has a background. She's a known quantity, not just on the city council, uh, but in the uh, United, uh, in, forgive me, in the Missouri Senate. Um, I think uh, Quentin Lucas is more willing to uh, to strike out and kind of take on the development culture in Kansas City, but we don't really know um, a long history. Well, of it. judging from what I've read in the Star at their one or two debates so far, the audience questions seem to suggest that people are fed up with the development downtown and the money going sure to major corporations and they want emphasis on the neighborhoods. Yeah, you know, a few weeks ago you asked the panel what to, a question would they want to ask in the debate and, and Jason said he wants to know what people's big bold idea is and I, I disagree. I think people in Kansas City don't want bold ideas. They want the sidewalks fixed. They want the lights to work. They want infrastructure. We've had it with big bold ideas. We want to make sure the city. They want safe neighborhoods. I want both. I want everything. So. <laughs> that, that's kind of the job though. The primary job of local government is to take care of basic needs basic like needs. streets, mm -hmm. police. Well you would fire. think that but in Kansas City over the past eight years we've neglected the basics. All right. Kansas legislative session is over for this year and so presumably is the expectation that Kansas would see Medicaid expansion. The new governor, Laura Kelly, says Senate Republicans committed politics, that's my term, not hers, <laughs> by keeping the measure in committee, not bringing it to the floor for a vote. Kelly says if there had been a vote, expansion would have passed. The governor is quoted as saying Republican leaders never even tried to help. First question, are Republican leaders expected to help a Democratic governor achieve her major legislative goal? We'll start with Laura, then go to Lisa. Well, you know, probably not, but I think resolving the Medicare and Medicaid issues in Kansas is on the incumbent on the legislature, and it's but it's also incumbent upon the governor to come together and try to work to, to, to fashion a solution, and I don't think it's ever good policy <coughs> just to create legislation, to create legislation which may which may lead to other unintended consequences. So I'm I'm, I'm just tired of all the sound bites. I'm tired of hearing about the personal attacks. Um, they need to get in a room and work it out. All right, uh, Lisa, same question. Are Republican leaders expected to help a Democrat governor achieve her major goal or vice versa? Well, certainly not in the hyper-partisan environment we find ourselves in. Although I understand the governor's disappointment <coughs> in that back when uh, Sam Brownback was still the governor, the Republican-controlled State House and Senate passed Medicaid expansion, which the governor at that time vetoed. So it does seem that there were a number of folks who understood that that was an important thing to do. So I do understand her disappointment with it in that the Republican House and Senate did it before, and so now it does seem a little bit hypocritical that they are unwilling to do it. Well, there are, different, yeah, well, there are some different well, members well, now, though, I think. There are, there are different members, and in the last go-around, the Kansas 
Democratic Party went after a whole lot of moderate Republicans, and they, it was all scorched earth, and they wanted to get rid of any Republican. And so they got rid of a whole lot of coalitions, which is going to make it really difficult for this governor, I think, to get things done because she's destroyed coalitions that may have been very willing to work with her. Well, I don't think it was all her, but ultimately it does come down to people being willing to do what's right for the people of the state. Well, no, yeah, she didn't do it. It was she, the party I mean, that did it. Correct, correct. Oh. People being willing to do what's right for the people of the state. And the reality is that the federal government created this hole that people are now in, and the state does need to figure out what they're going to do well, about that. What, what people, what, what group of people don't get Medicaid and need Medicaid expansion? Well, that's a great question. A lot of the rhetoric around Medicaid expansion in, in Kansas was, was just flat wrong. People said they were doing it for the kids, but uh, uh, children in Kansas actually have more and better benefits now than they would have under Medicaid. 20% of the state budget goes to Medicaid spending, and the federal government has been backing off the amount it's covering. It is a we talk about education in Kansas, talk about Medicaid. You can't just keep spending on everything. And at some point, these uh, programs, these big bloated programs, are, are going to edge out every other important But, but the people who are left out are not people who have uh, physical handicaps or something of that sort. If I understand correctly, they make too much money to qualify for Medicaid mm -hmm. and not enough money to get Obamacare with uh, subsidy, extra money with, with subsidies. I think they is, call is that, that the working poor. Why don't, we just, why don't we just change Medicaid? Paid for by the federal government, Mike, and, and 36 states have already done this. I mean, when I was in the legislature in 2009 and 10, we were talking about Medicaid expansion in Missouri, and I think Missouri still hasn't done it or Kansas. So, I mean, this is like the school funding issue that you're going to get to. Like, it's going to keep going and going and going until something happens. Thank but. you. Thank you for bringing us to the school finance issue. <laughs> uh, one justice on the Supreme Court asked one of the attorneys for the school districts, a question I think we've asked on this program a number of times over the last several years, is this ever going to end? And, and Lisa, it looks like this time it might. I think it will. I think everyone is ready for a break with this, and I think the court is going to be satisfied that the legislature tried to honor the direction that they were giving them. And certainly there are still parties out there that want to sue and ask for more, but I think that this will be the end of it for a little while. Patrick, does uh, Governor Kelly deserve any credit for her first session as governor, first legislative session? Well, it, does, uh, it doesn't appear that uh, Kansas did much. Um, you know, there's that, be that more. could be a blessing. Uh, well, certainly, no. <laughs> but believe me, I don't disagree with that at all. Sometimes, uh, what did Lincoln say? Government's best, which governs least. Uh, uh, you know, but education is is exactly what we've talked about for months. In that, uh, the school districts want more than what the legislature is going to give them. And, and as I've said on this program before, the school districts have every incentive to sue in perpetuity because the Supreme Court hasn't defined what is adequate and it's, it's always just more. And, and so I think uh, one of the justices asked, are we just going to be back here yeah. in a few years? And yes. I, you know, I just wish some enterprising reporter would spend the time and find out how much tax money has been spent to pay attorneys to lobby mm, and right. argue in court yes. for more school finance in Kansas. Yeah. All right, I never expected there would be 300 people running. <laughs> that is a quip from former VP Joe Biden, who now sits atop all the polls for the 2020 Democratic presidential nomination. Biden exaggerated a bit, as he tends to do, but it's hard to keep track. At least 20 Democrats, probably a few more, say they are in the race. There are familiar candidates, Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, all senators, to name a few. Lesser knowns include John Delaney, Andrew Yang, and Tulsi Gabbard. Let's start with this. Do Democrats benefit by having a large number of candidates in the race for president? If so, why do they benefit? If not, why do they not? Jason? I think they do. Uh, it's a wide spectrum of people from all different parts of the party, which I like. Uh, it's got to 24 now, I believe, this morning. Uh, it definitely benefits Joe Biden. I mean, he's the, all these people are going to cannibalize each other, and he's obviously going to be the front runner. And if he wins Iowa, you know, it's going to be tough for anyone else. But uh, I think it's good for the party. I enjoy it. It's good for us to watch and, and follow. But uh, I can, I, I don't have a problem with it, honestly. And I know Joe Biden doesn't have a problem with well, it. Either. The fact that there are so many, there will be a lot of factions, people backing each, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. many people disappointed by the outcome. Will that cause problems? Maybe. I mean, eventually, at the end of the day, the Democrats just want to be President Trump, and, and I'm hopeful that 
you know, we kind of stay with a moderate to centrist candidate. I worry about kind of some of the far left, like a Bernie Sanders winning the nomination. But I think with so many good candidates, I, I don't think that'll happen. Do you, do you think uh, Biden is performing well? I, I know his polls he, are good. He hasn't I've had many gaffes. I've yet, watched so. him being interviewed and answering questions. He doesn't seem to be up to date on some things. He's been out of campaigning for a long time. Right. He's, he's, he's getting his numbers based on name ID, being the vice president at the Obama years, uh, familiarity. And as soon as these debates start, we're going to see more people probably start to challenge him and, and kind of rise up in the polls. Uh, Pete Buttigieg did that with his town hall performances. He's an intellectual person. I think there's going to be more of that. And uh, it all comes down to the first state. You know, Iowa this year or next year is going to have a different caucus system where we're going to find out who goes with each person, which will be interesting instead of just finding out the end results. Well, we can pronounce the last name of the mayor from South Bend now, so that, <laughs> that, that's some real progress. Uh, is there a genuine concern among Democrats, Lisa, that the party is moving or has a tendency to be moving too far to the left? I think some people are concerned about that, but some aren't. I think that the danger here is that too many Democrats think that no matter who the nominee is, that they can beat Donald Trump in a walk. And that is flatly incorrect. If you look at the matchup polling, the only two candidates thus far who have polled significantly beyond the margin of error in a head-to-head -head against President Trump are Joe Biden and in a, a couple of polls, Bernie Sanders. Everybody else, there have been a few hits and misses here and there, but nobody's beyond the margin of error. And let's not forget how inaccurate polls can be. That's what happened with Hillary Clinton going into 2016. Everybody thought she's going to win in a walk. She's up five to seven points. So the party needs to be extremely careful about who they nominate, and it needs to be someone who's really strong enough to compete and win. And these folks, it's early, but these folks down in zero to two percent, they're not going anywhere. I mean, they they can be in there for interest's sake, but who remembers the Lincoln Chafee or the Jim Webb surge yeah. in 2016? <laughs> it didn't happen, and it's not going to happen for most of these I folks I guess either. the most recent entrant was Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York City. Yes. Any chance Laura Kelly is going to jump in? <laughs> no, I doubt it. I think she wants uh -huh. to continue being governor of Kansas. <laughs> uh, Bill Clinton famously said, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, if the economy is doing as well next year as it is this year, will Democrats have a tough time unseating Donald Trump? Well, I think they will. I, I think it's all pie in the sky um, that it's going to be a cakewalk to beat Donald Trump. I, I, I do, because I think people are, are going to look at the economy and, you know, particularly his base. He's done what he said he was going to do. I mean, tweets aside, he's he's followed a lot of good policy that people, the Republicans in particular, want him to follow. And, you know, I don't know, there was a big surge in votes last time, but some of those folks are one-and-done voters. I don't know that they'll come out. And I don't know that a big pack of Democrats really help. And I don't, I mean, I think Joe Biden could have beat him in the last election. I don't know that he's beaten him in 2020. Quick final know. question, Patrick. What's Trump's major weakness? Oh, my gosh. Donald Trump's major weakness is Donald Trump. Yeah. Uh, but, look, a lot of consultants will tell him, put down the phone and, uh, and stop it. But he's got a knack for inserting himself into issues and riling people up. And I would be hesitant to tell him to change his ways. And Joe Biden's greatest deficit? Uh, also Joe Biden. Uh, <laughs> you know, as somebody uh, outside of the party, I am interested to see if this kind of uh, Twitter woke uh, progressive movement within the Democratic Party is really just uh, a nothing burger. And if uh, Biden continues to dominate, I think you'll see that there was nothing ever to that, uh, to that movement. All right. Now we're going to head over to the soapbox. It's time for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckheads have 30 seconds each, or however long they choose to talk, to imply, <laughs> deny, or defy. And let's begin with Laura. So I'm going to roast the legislatures that are continuing to um, focus on abortion to the exclusion of real things that affect real people's lives, like schools and roads and um, public safety and uh, taking care of seniors' medical needs. I think it's a huge distraction. It spends a whole lot of budget and money and creates a lot of angst and anger that really shouldn't be there. Mr. Tuohy? A toast to Pete Mundo, whose morning drive time show on KCMO Radio explores local and regional public policy issues. Mundo has his own views, but he welcomes guests from Kansas and Missouri and around the country, Republican and Democrat, left and right, including members of Congress, local leaders, and Governors Kelly and Parson. 
If you enjoy learning other policy perspectives than your own, and given that you're watching Ruckus, I presume you do, uh, turn off one-sided radio programming like KCUR and turn on Pete Mundo on KCMO. What time is he on? 5.30 to 10? He's so on drive time in the morning. Okay. Uh, Jason? Uh, I like that toast. Pete's a good dude. Um, I want to uh, roast this election cycle we've been hearing all about. You have to pick the east side. You have to pick downtown. You have to pick sewers. You have to pick infrastructure. If we're going to excel as a city, we have to be able to excel at all of these things to compete with our peer cities. And I'm, I'm getting really frustrated about the choices that are being made. Why can't we all figure out a way to increase Kansas City on all levels? Downtown's not finished yet. East side isn't had enough time spent on it. Uh, there's all kinds of issues. We need to do all of these things if we're gonna be a great city. And I hope we'll talk about that more instead of choosing sides. As Rodney King famously said, why can't we all just get along? There you go. Uh, Lisa. We don't need to dive into Medicare for all, but we should adopt <laughs> Medicare for more to solve two important problems. An infusion of younger, healthier individuals buying in at higher rates to the Medicare system early could provide a needed financial boost to the system while at the same time providing a stable options to replace the lackluster Obamacare insurance plans. Strategic change can be great if Congress will get off their duffs and do something meaningful for the American people. And finally, it's been a tough couple of weeks for the nation's attorney general, Bill Barr. He's undergone harsh questioning about the Mueller report from Democratic senators and found in contempt of Congress by the Democrat-controlled House Judiciary Committee. A Meet the Press headline described his situation best. Apologies to Jason. Headline was Barr and grill. <laughs> and that's Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckus and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks for watching and good night.